Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I'm thrilled to, to have two of our wonderful alumni speaking with us and sharing their experiences. Uh, before, before we do that, um, I will share a little bit about my background. Um, so I did my training um, in public health management and my, in global health as well. And uh, my background prior to academia was really overseeing uh, non-governmental organizations doing international global health work and development work, um, as well as working with private medical groups and other domestic nonprofit companies. And then since I've joined USC, I direct the online National Public Health Program, and I teach a few of our global health courses in leadership and in ethics, as well as oversee the education programs for the Institute on Inequalities and Global Health. So that's a little bit about my background. And then um, just to share with you a little bit about the School of Medicine, uh, Keck School of Medicine at, of USC. So we were established in 1885, and we're actually the oldest medical school in Southern California. We are affiliated with several hospitals and research centers and institutes, um, do a lot of research at this place, uh, cutting-edge research. And our Department of Preventive Medicine, which is where the MPH program is housed, is actually uh, one of the leading departments in the country um, for NIH-sponsored research. Um, sorry, I apologize, folks. I think the slide skipped. Um, and so our department itself is organized into six divisions, um, including disease prevention and global health, bioinformatics, biostatistics, epidemiology, environmental health, and health behavior research. And we have over 100 faculty within our department, many of whom teach in the NCH online program. So the online program itself offers a rigorous curriculum, and we offer six different concentrations within the program that students can specialize in, um, whether they would be interested in biostatistics and epidemiology, community health promotion, geohealth, which is a combination of spatial analysis and public health, and uh, a global health track, a health services and policy concentration, as well as a generalist concentration for those students who hold advanced degrees and are looking to kind of design their own curriculum within public health. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the geohealth concentration specifically, as we have the pleasure of hearing from two of our students who went through this concentration. Uh, this is a really unique concentration that we offer here at USC. Not too many public health programs actually offer this. Um, combination of, of skill sets and knowledge where it's an increasingly in-demand skill set for public health professionals to be able to do GIS mapping and spatial analysis techniques and apply those to public health problems and solutions. So in this concentration, students develop skills and knowledge as a public health professional to explore how different geographical contexts shape health outcomes, trends, and inequalities. Um, and use spatial analysis techniques to solve these problems at both local and regional levels. So the courses involve spatial thinking, spatial analysis, the GIS courses, um, cartography and visualization. There's a new course on uh, mobile health applications. And then students also can choose from electives uh, within environmental health and program evaluation, all after completing their core courses in public health. After students complete their um, core and concentration courses, um, students then complete a practicum, which is basically an, an internship opportunity um, or volunteer opportunity with any sort of agency dealing with the public's health. So we have affiliations with over 400 sites worldwide where students can complete their practicum um, based on their interests, whether you want to work with an NGO, you want to work with a nonprofit, you want to work with the county health department, you want to work with the WHO, you want to work with you know, the United Nations or the bank, we have plenty of options for students to pursue a practicum in their location of interest, with the type of agency that they're interested in, and that list is constantly growing based on student interest. Um, and so this opportunity is really meant to apply the skills that you're learning in the coursework um, hands-on on the job. And oftentimes students will complete a practicum at their place of work if they are already working somewhere that is dealing with the public health, um, as long as it's a new project that they're working on, or um, they can choose to do this at another location or agency, and many times students will then use this opportunity as a stepping stone um, towards their next job. 
So now I'd like to introduce um, two of our student uh, speakers today, alumni, I should say. Um, our first um, is, is Tiara Heron, who completed her MPH with us, and she's now the Director of Research and Data at Antelope Valley. I'm sorry, I think the slide skipped. Ah, there we go. Um, Director of Research and Data at Antelope Valley Partners for Health, and she had her BS in Public Health Education from Cal State Northridge and graduated with her MPH online from USC in 2018. Um, she led the development of the internal data management processes for the home visitation programs at Antelope Valley Partners for Health and is interested in project management, development, grant rating, data visualization, and exploring innovative ways to use data and share information about health disparities to communities. Tiara also went through um, the GeoHealth concentration. And after Tiara shares her experiences with us, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from Nathan Morgan, who was an active duty veteran of the U.S. Air Force and a veteran of the California Air National Guard. Um, he worked for the U.S. federal government under the Department of Commerce with NOAA National Marine Fishery Service as a consultant safety officer. Um, Nathan graduated with his BS in environmental health and as well as his MPH then from USC in spring 2019. And he's part of the team that inspects vessels, marine fishery docks, processing facilities, and retail facilities throughout LA and surrounding counties to ensure food is safe for commerce and consumption. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Tiara. If you could please share more about your experiences. Hi, thank you, Dr. Kumar. All right, like Dr. Kumar mentioned, um, I'm Tiara Figueron, uh, Director of Research and Data here at ABPH. Uh, ABPH, or Antelope Valley Partners for Health, is a 501c3 nonprofit agency whose mission is to educate, strengthen, and advocate for the community through resources, partnerships, uh, achieving optimal health and quality of life for all people living in the Antelope Valley. Um, our vision is that all children, families, and individuals in the Antelope Valley have optimal psychosocial, physical, and environmental health. Um, why the MPH online program? So I became a director at ABPH prior to starting the online program, and I was looking for a program that was convenient to my schedule. I do work a 40 to 60 hour a week work schedule, depending on the week, if we had grab a grant due. Uh, so I needed something that was a little convenient, flexible, and I have the opportunity of working with some of the faculty that are in the MPH program currently. And so they also urged me to look at USC program, so that was great. Why GeoHealth? So I became interested in GeoHealth uh, or GIS through a project that I assisted with with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. I worked with some colleagues to conduct some window surveys and an, a spatial analysis of grocery store outlets and fast food restaurants and their proximity to elementary schools and, in the city of Lancaster. And so we were able to layer data that was collected to create a map that you can see here on the slide that depicted hot spots in the city correlating whether fast food restaurants was an issue in high poverty levels. And we were able to, one of the benefits of having this type of map is that we are able to try to take this to city officials, to take this information to distribute as, as um, to see if they're able to make policy changes or new zoning permits to, to, for the better health of the community. What, with this project, I was, I was literally hooked in learning more about how data mapping can tell a story beyond just numbers and tables and figures. Okay. So with that, I'd want to share a little bit about my practicum experience. So I actually completed my practice practicum with the Department of Public Health Vaccine Preventable Disease Control Program. And I um, highly recommend uh, looking at securing a site if possible early, just because you never know 
how much you need to do per your site as far as background checks, paperwork, fingerprinting. You don't know how long it may take. So just make sure that when you're looking at practicums or your internship opportunities to try to see what you're looking for and putting your feelers out there early on so that you can picture a site that you may want. For my practicum, like I mentioned, it was at the Department of Public Health, and my two primary objectives for uh, the practicum was, one, to develop fact sheets uh, on preventable, preventable diseases as measles, pertussis, uh, varicella, mumps for the general community and for clinicians. And secondly, I was to explore the correlation between um, a decrease in personal belief exemption and the potential increase of personal medical exemptions after the passing of California SB 277 in the school year 16-17. So we're looking to investigate whether personal belief status coincide, like decrease in personal belief status coincided with an increase in conditional entrance or medical exemption. And uh, we were looking at relationships to identify, uh, to complete a hotspot analysis in conjunction with a logistical regression. About the fact sheets. So even though I was tasked to do several fact sheets for physicians and the general public on several diseases, I was only, um, one of the requirements before creating the fact sheets was to conduct a literature review on each of the diseases and compile uh, a repository so that the county had backing for these fact sheets. And that was um, timely. <laughs> just because you have to do your research and make sure that what you're providing to the general public is up to date. And then, so I was only able to create two fact sheets during my time and this because it has, it was timely, one. And two, it made me realize that even though I have firsthand experience on my in my agency in getting documents approved and, and out to the community. It's different when you're working at, at a county level because there's a lot more levels of approval. And so a, a lot of the material that was created by the time I left the, my internship, it wasn't fully approved yet and it wasn't out to the general public. But there's a lot more layers than a nonprofit is. I didn't know that until getting that experience. So that was a learning experience um, for exploring for the vaccine actual data for exploring the coalition between potential diseases for per, uh, personal belief exemptions we evaluated two school years of vaccine data that predicted a uh, decrease of vaccine preventable Sorry, that predicted a decrease of vaccine personal belief exemption rates and potential increases of vaccine medical exemptions uh, for the state because of the bill that was the, the California Senate Bill 227 in 2006. With this change, we hypothesized that vaccine um, hesitant parents would seek other vaccine school entry options in order to keep their children unvaccinated, particularly in, particularly in schools that are that were in affluent communities. So we used a, um, the ARC GIS Pro to explore relationships between the variables and to create hot, a hotspot analysis, hotspot analysis as you can see on the slide above. Um, after the logistic regression analysis and after geocoding these high-risk schools, we confirmed our hypothesis that schools located in affluent communities would be at risk for vaccine preventable disease outbreaks due to the higher unvaccinated rates amongst their students. Uh, data like this help inform new legislation, legislations 
like those um, cracking down currently on physicians that are doing exemptions without the, uh, the medical need. Okay. So one of the things that through the work on the fast food projects, one of my colleagues introduced me to my mentor and, and future practicum supervisor and I was gracious enough to meet him in person at APHA, which is a conference uh, that's held annually uh, for the nation, which recently just happened about two weeks ago. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity of meeting him at that at APHA in person, but I've met, like we would communicate via email prior to that. I highly recommend if you're able to go to conferences like APHA because it's a great networking opportunity uh, and it gives you exposure to the different fields and directions that you can go to um, in the public in public health. And you never know who you're going to meet and what relationships you can build from in just a simple meet and greet or, or at conferences like APHA. So what am I doing now? At, um, currently, as director of the research and data department, I oversee the data management for the home visitation program here at AVPH. Um, and some of the things that we do is quality assurance activities. So for example, earlier this week, I shared the quarter one data for one of our teams and we talked about uh, how we performed in some of our benchmark measures and how many people we served and how many people graduated our program and, and talked about its successes and then areas where we felt that we can improve. So we tried to be very um, strength-based at our agency. So it's never our challenges uh, or faults. It's more of like er needs improvement. So we are always can improve and we always can make things better. The other thing is I am currently the interim director of operations, so I review all of our financial statements, invoices for the agency, so I work on programmatic budgets for some of our grants in my, in our, in my department and other departments as um, they need assistance. I oversee all of the IT needs of the agency, so it's inventory of uh, computers, phones, Anything electronic equipment goes through uh, my department. Currently, I'm in the process of conducting a needs assessment to, com to complete a cultural, cultural analysis plan for one of our home visitation programs to identify how the program could better serve the target population that, that we have as it relates to materials, at, is, is the staff culturally uh, compatible to the clients that we're serving and um, so we're doing focus groups and interviews with some of our participants as well as some of our partnering agencies to make sure anybody that we're referring to is also um, competent uh, in, in not competent but we're doing our due diligence to make sure that we're doing what we we're trying to meet the needs of the program and Additionally, I also oversee the assessment worker staff for a randomized control trial uh, study that we're partnering with with USC and Cedar Cyanide. So we're currently, this study is an NIH funded study and I work with the lead PIs to supervise the assessment workers that go and collect baseline data and data at certain intervals as it pertains to the study and we meet with these researchers on a weekly basis and uh, with the assessment workers I meet with them on a daily basis or every other day as the needs permit. Just a little bit of what, what we do. Um, professional development at AZTH. So as head of the department I'm now overseeing about 25 employees in seven different programs and what I value in some of the of some of the work that the MPH program provides is 
all the different aspects, activities that you can do with staff. And um, I learned a lot to do, dealing with staff and in leadership is in one course that we took, which is leadership and management in public health. Uh, this course is required for everybody to take in the MPH program. But after taking this course, I understood the importance of self-awareness and being aware of your strengths and areas where you can improve and so that you know what your limitations are and where you can have colleagues help you if there's an area that you may not be proficient in. So what we, so what we do as um, monthly meetings, we do have department meetings. And I plan these meetings with my associate directors and the supervisors on my team to, one, do professional development activities so that the staff can better know themselves so they could identify traits that, one, they need to improve on or that they can help their colleagues with. So one of the activities we've done is a uh, personality uh, test so that they could better know their traits and their assets. And also we've done um, the love language or generational training so that you can better work with different generations. So I have baby boomers, millennials, and the uh, Gen Xers in, in my department. So sometimes uh, we have issues with different generations working together. So we've gone through some training activities to better know what each kind of um, age group have traits so that they, people don't get offended if you're questioned. It's very interesting. It's a good uh, training to get to know ourselves and how we can better serve the community and work well with each other. So since uh, getting my MPH, I also have the liberty of taking on interns now, especially those that are at the bachelor level. And what we've, I've been able to do is provide them the opportunity to work with the different programs that I oversee and as um, uh, and giving them opportunities to do health education classes to parents, uh, review grant proposals, uh, and working with our food pantry. Lastly, advice for the new coming students. So I would have to say that um, I would encourage everyone to make sure that they stay involved uh, and making sure when you're involved and make sure that it's true to yourself and that you love what you do. There's several different areas that you can go to in public health and directions that you can go as an occupational health and environmental health or even just health education. Um, and it, although the options may be overwhelming, there is, if you change your mind, you can definitely, there's different ways you can go. I actually started, like I mentioned, here at ADVHS uh, in my undergrad, and I gradually worked my way up, and um, which wasn't the path that I originally wanted. I actually uh, wanted to be a nurse originally in my undergrad program, and while working at ADVH, I was exposed to the different areas and the aspects that you can be involved with uh, in the public health field, and I realized that I wanted to make a greater impact. I wanted to make more than an individual impact and uh, more of a community impact. And some of the programs that we have to offer, like I mentioned, the food pantry, we serve over 200 families, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables on a biweekly basis, and that's much larger than what I could do with a nurse working one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so, like I mentioned earlier, I believe, is one of the reasons why I, I, I sought out a master's degree is um, when I was promoted, um, I was fairly young. I've been a director for about six years now, and I was the only director at the time that had limited experience in comparison to my colleagues, and I felt the need to make sure the need that, uh, to be marketable, and in order to be marketable, uh, I needed to make sure that I had the backing, the degree to be taken seriously in my role as director, especially being at such a young age. Um, 
And so having that, the master's degree gave me that confidence and the reassurance that I could do what I was tasked to do, even on days when I thought that it wasn't possible. Um, uh, thank you for listening, and I hope at the end I'll be available for any questions. Thank you, Tiara. Hi, everyone. This is Nathan Morga. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Kumar introduced me, I graduated my MPH uh, just this past spring. I had a geo-health concentration. Now I work for the Department of Commerce in NOAA. That's the National Oceanographic and Admi Atmospheric Administration as a consumer safety officer in Long Beach, California. Uh, previously, I was in the Air Force and the California National Guard. Uh, my undergrad was with the University of Maryland in environmental management, and then I worked as an aviation weather forecaster for the Navy and the National Weather Service. So a little bit about, about my career path. Uh, as you can see, I did not have much public health experience. I worked military and weather and contracting. Um, now, I work for the U.S. Department of Commerce, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, National Marine Fisheries, Southwest Seafood Inspection Branch, the Office of International Affairs and Seafood Inspection as a Consumer Safety Officer. Yeah, that's my full job title and position, uh, but basically I'm just a federal health inspector. So now a little bit about the Department of Commerce. Uh, as a seafood inspector, I inspect vessels, uh, marine fisheries, docks, and processing facilities. I go in to make sure that they do uh, HACCP certs and their uh, processes are correct and up-to-date and, and uh, aligned with federal code. I service LA. Uh, I've been up to Santa Barbara County, Ventura County. I also do sanitation inspection and audits, uh, product creating, lab analyses, training consultations, and export certifications. Uh, my job ensure food is, is safe for uh, commerce and issue certificates of safety for that reason. Some of the great perks of being a, in a federal position, if any of those interested, uh, make yourself familiar with USA Jobs. Uh, we get great, actually probably the best health, life, and disability benefits. Uh, we have employee assistance programs, child dependent care, retirement, percent matching for retirement, and uh, military buyback. Uh, we have competitor salaries, annual raises, and we get uh, increase in vacation time the longer you're there, and of course, uh, job security. However, the reason I accepted this job, this, uh, in addition to those other reasons, was the travel. This this job field has some of the most extensive travel available to the federal government. Uh, it includes traveling to docks and processing facilities across the world. And the reason I got this job was because of my master's in public health degree. Uh, it has been really useful to have my master's of public health degree, uh, despite the personal satisfaction, the endless career possibilities, and the array of useful skills. It's just being able to say, you know, I've, I'm qualified for this job. Uh, I was absolutely certain I only got hired because I had my MPH from USC. I did not have any direct experience in public health uh, before, just a little bit of undergrad work. So. Now they're even talking about making a position just for me, an internal position, to take advantage of my GIS and remote sensing skills so I can keep track of fisheries, algae blooms, and stuff across the world using a lot of the skills I learned at USC. Another thing I learned from USC is really important in this job field was organization, teamwork, working well with others, meeting deadlines, and reliability. These are the soft skills that USC taught me along with their leadership and communication classes. So. I would pay attention to those as you move on through the field. Now, why did I choose my MPH online? For me, it was a matter of convenience. I worked full time. I have a family. I was in the Air National Guard when I was going through the course. Uh, still, I was able to graduate in two and a half years. That's because I worked with USC and they worked with me. The counselors knew my name, they knew my goals, and they knew my challenges. I was they were open to communication. All the professors, they all understood that life happens. Everyone there wants you to succeed. Uh, after a while, the, the application and the programs became second nature and then assignments. 
they were due in the evening. So theoretically speaking, not speaking from experience, of course, uh, you can start and finish an assignment on the same day and turn it in on time. I was able to correspond with professors and counselors really easily. And uh, even when I decided I wanted to switch from epidemiology and biostatistics track to geohealth track, it happened within one semester. So USC really worked with me to get uh, through the course and do the best I could do. So a little bit about geohealth. What is geohealth? Uh, it's merging of geography and public health, but it's actually a lot more than that. You learn about the statistics behind the spread of disease, how to map and to forecast it. Uh, for me, why I went to GeoHealth, uh, it was very similar to my weather career field. Uh, as you can see, uh, a satellite picture on the right and the algae boom on the left is, you know, just bridging the difference between the two. And, and forecasting the spread of the West Nile was so much more fun than forecasting a warm front in California. So I got to learn more about geographic information systems like ArcGIS, uh, GIS systems are powerful programs that take location information similar to a GPS navigation system and they merge it with non-location information. So you learn to merge roads, hospitals, liquor store locations, tobacco retail locations with demographic information, uh, income, income disparity, and then other public health issues like tracking the spread of disease. You can create layers and intersections to see where the relevant information is and how to display it and look for patterns. You can also learn a little bit more about remote sensing. Uh, and that's like the picture there on the left. Remote sensing is a gathering of information from off-site and interpreting imagery using instruments like satellites, airplanes, and uh, hyperspectral imagery, which is stuff just beyond the visual field we can see. Uh, other things I learned about ArcGIS is that it can be its own pursuit. So if you enjoy some of the, the classes offered here, you see spatial thinking, cartography, visualization, spatial analysis, and remote sensing. I would consider testing with one of the two certificate certification authorities. These are uh, the GISP certificate, which is pretty much acceptable ride. And then there's the ESRI technical certification, which is specifically for ArcGIS use. So you will learn a lot in these courses. There's a lot to learn. Uh, you become, you have to become adept in Microsoft Office and Google Drive applications. Uh, Excel will be your, your best friend and your worst enemy in GeoHealth. Other programs may use uh, include statistics software like SPSS and SAS, and and then there are also formula applications and methodologies as well that you need to consider. Just as you will learn a lot and do a lot in this program. The top picture there is a row of geographic information for the ArcGIS data tables and the bottom one. I turned some of the information into a timetable that shows primary wind direction in different areas of Bakersfield, California. And what I did there, I looked for correlation between wind coming from nearby farmlands and then increased incidences of ozone and particulate matter 2.5 and 10 microns. These are all harmful chemicals that exceeded EPA recommendations. Uh, I really did enjoy that project, and fortunately, I ran out of time, and my practicum kind of took over. But there was so much more to learn, and uh, I hope to learn more about those correlations in the future. But as for my practicum, uh, I was so busy that I waited until the last minute to start my practicum, and I really regret that. Still, I was lucky enough to get in with Ventura County in my second to last semester. Uh, the way I did it, I just made a cold call. I was like, hey, I'm a student at USC can you pick me up as an intern? And they were familiar with students from USC, and they got me a spot as soon as they were able. However, because I waited so long, I had to squeeze internship hours in the morning and then continue uh, to my evening work. And this happened pretty much Monday through Friday for, for a couple of months. Uh, however, once they saw my capabilities, they allowed me to do remote work, which helped tremendously. So what were my, capab what were my capabilities and what could I do uh, what can I bring to the table? A lot of stuff that I learned from USC. I recreated and improved their existing maps. I used their extensive database to create ma more maps. Uh, using the tobacco survey data, I made a map of tobacco retailers across Ventura County. See there on the top map, there's more than 600 retailers across the county. And in the bottom map, I used a statistical method called hotspot analysis mapping to determine 
uh, that's where you determine statistically significant concentrations of retailers. And from there, uh, I overlay the information with the poverty income and I was able to show correlation between poor areas and higher densities of tobacco retailers. And this is already a well-known correlation, but the county was able to visualize this information using the maps they made and appeal to a wider audience. And as far as I know, uh, these maps are still being used in a, a Ventura County. And uh, they use it to influence more policy changes and ident identify uh, further areas of concern and make it easy for uh, anyone, you know, the policymakers, to, to visualize. And as far as I know, these maps are still in use. Uh, I doubt there will be any updates because while I was there, there weren't too many people who were savvy in GIS. So if anyone wants to do internship there, uh, you can definitely take up the mantle. And um, one of the things I want to do is just give a little bit of advice. Uh, discover what motivates you. You know, you can find the balance. Uh, you need perseverance. The time will pass. You can make the best of it. Use the resources available. Counselors. I want to give a shout out to my former counselor, advisor, excuse me, Jessica Demas. Uh, she always pointed me in the right direction, and I swear she took notes about all the conversations. And then uh, for any veterans out there who may be listening, use the resource available to you. The GI Bill Yellow Ribbon Program is offered by USC for most of the programs. Uh, every, anytime I called, the, NAS, the staff was very helpful and knowledgeable. So that's all I have for you. Thank you for your time, and uh, I'd love to ask, answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Tiara and, and Dr. Kumar for, for your time here, for the information that you've uh, gone through. Um, we'll cover through your questions. Um, we've had a, a good list here, um, as we'd like to, to touch upon. Um, Tiara, I know um, as you have been answering some of them as too, but we'll, we'll cover through so just everyone might be able to hear that and, and see that. Um, I know um, we had the question here as to initially as you talked about your, your fact sheets. Um, and, and really, I just wanted to ask how the fact sheets are distributed uh, for the country, whether they be printed or whether they be by web. So the fact sheets for the county are going to be available both printed and web. Great. Thank you. And then as well, um, I think there was a question is if you had planned on presenting in the future at the APHA uh, HA, uh, about your, your current position. So, not currently as on my current position, um, but we have, at the agency we have presented at APHA in 2017, we piloted a community wellness project that we shared at APHA for, I think it's community improvement session. Um, it was, uh, we had developed in collaboration with the city of Lancaster a project called um, YOLO Lancaster. You only live once in the city of Lancaster and it really was working with several restaurants and um, gyms and different partners from different sectors to encourage health and wellness and we it was a point system. It was it was very innovative. It's still going on today. It's not as well advertised now so it's hard to get people to enroll but the prize you get at the end of the year is twenty five hundred dollars is the, the person that gets the most points so we presented that pilot project at APHA great thank you Tia and as well for you um, so how do you divide up your time to handle operations and research uh, at your current position So I, right now, a lot of our my time is in mainly on operations and administrative, and I have less time now devoted to research. But currently, we only have one research project, and I oversee two staff on that project. So I, I dedicate maybe about 10 to 20 percent of my time on that project, I'm making sure everybody's staffed and I meet with the PIs as needed. So I try to balance as the needs of the program required. Never enough time in the day, right? 
it, that is yeah. very true. <laughs> Uh, and the next one for Dr. Kumar, um, how did the partnership with the Spatial Sciences Institute come about to offer the GeoHealth concentration? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we were seeing an increasing demand for, for public health professionals with this kind of skill set uh, based on our collaborations with different organizations who are practicing public health. And so the Spatial Sciences Institute also had an online program, and we had an online MPH program. So the head of the Spatial Science Institute, um, Dr. John Wilson, came to me and, and said, like, is there a way we can collaborate? And we found a way to make it work so that the curriculum would allow students both exposure to public health and spatial sciences. And we also offer a joint PhD program uh, in population, place, and health, again, because this field is so emerging and there's really not many universities who offer this kind of specialization but the demand is definitely there. So it's a great skill set to be able to learn um, and will serve you quite well, as you can see, uh, with our alums who, who just talked about it. Thank you. And, Tiara, um, so this is such an emerging topic. Uh, are there parts of the program that you use in your everyday career? Did you connect with your professors after graduating? Uh, yes, so there uh, there are parts that I use day to day. I'm currently uh, working on a very uh, on a program that we're going to be starting here with collaboration with school nurses. Uh, as uh, there, we have a high um, asthma uh, asthma rate because of the dust in our area. So we're going to look at uh, seeing if we can track some of the students and asthma-related incidents at the school level to see if certain schools have a higher um, incidence rate here in the future. It's very, like, in its infancy. So we just had a meeting with the American Lung Association and the nurses, our first meeting, about two weeks ago. So, but the idea is to try to identify areas in the community that may have a higher, higher incidence rate. So... Um, Right now, I wouldn't say, I think it, it like fluctuates in my current, in, in this, in, at AVPH, when I can use the GIS skills. And they definitely volunteer me for any data mapping, even if it's not for the agency for partners as well, because it's not, not a lot of people have the skills or the background to do some of these things. I get voluntold to do a lot of things by my executive director, believe it or not. And then did I connect with my professors? Yeah, I actually have uh, emailing. I've been emailing some of them back and forth. And then I do have uh, some of my research colleagues, our PIs, our current associate director, I mean associate professors at USC. So I talk to them on a weekly basis. Thank you. And Nathan, you presented second, so it took a while to get to your questions. But um, were you worried about the time commitment with an online program, even though convenient online programs still require many hours per week, correct? How did you manage it? Well, uh, there was a lot of reasons I was able to manage it. Uh, my family worked with me really well. On the times I had off, I just bunkered down and did the work. Uh, I did. I was lucky enough that I can do a lot of my uh, reading at uh, my desk job. So that's the same one that I felt like it wasn't going anywhere. So I, I would do my readings there and then I do my assignments at home. And I guess like a lot of other graduate students, there's a lot of late nights, you know, and you just, uh, I just felt committed to the, the cause. So it really wasn't too difficult once I got a routine down. Thank you. And then, as well, Nathan, do the GeoHealth courses teach you how to use the new programs and software? Um, are the professors easily accessible? Oh, my goodness. I was so terrified of being introduced to GIS. I had done an attempt on it uh, earlier as, as a graduate, and I just ran away. But then uh, going into public health with USC, it was a huge difference. Uh, the professors were very helpful to give step-by-step -step instructions. They were always uh, easy to get a hold of and to help clarify things. So I would now consider myself very adept at ArcGIS still, even though it's been a couple of months since I've uh, had fingers on the board. Um, 
and yeah, it it you learn so much, and you you keep up to date with all the latest uh, versions that come out. So that definitely wasn't an issue. Great, and I think as well, kind of along those lines, um, you know, support structure, that sort of thing. How did you come about changing your track, and, and were you able to speak with professors about doing that? It wasn't too difficult to change my track. Uh, the first person I contacted was a student advisor. Everyone, as far as I know, get assigned a student advisor. And they know the process of the USC a lot better than I did. They tell you who to talk to, how difficult it was to change. I believe it went through Dr. Kumar, and she gave the final approval to change course. Uh, gave them a basic reason why. It's pretty much biostats wasn't interesting as much anymore, and geohealth was new and exciting, and I was m much more aligned to what I wanted to to deal with. So talking to two people and getting written off by two people, the signatures I needed, and I made the switch. I believe I talked to them in spring, and by that summer, I was ready to start my new courses. Thank you. And then kind of to piggyback off of that, Dr. Kumar, is it often that students change their track while going through the program or, or in their core classes after they start a track? Yeah, students do um, make changes. So, you know, when you enter the program or apply, you can select a track. But, um, you know, you have until the beginning of your concentration courses to really change it if you'd like to. And, of course, you know, some students choose to change during their concentration. So it's really pretty flexible. Um, but, of course, the advice is to try to change it before you start your track courses so you don't get delayed um, and have to take extra courses. But it's, it's, you know, we really do uh, cater to the student and their interests. You. And as well for you, Dr. Kumar, other than a county, where else would a geohealth student do a practicum? Yeah, great question. Um, so besides county departments, there are several types of organizations who are interested in doing this kind of work, including the CDC, um, the WHO, the UN, if you're interested in international organizations. Uh, there's various research institutions and universities who are looking at this kind of work. Um, so different government agencies. So there's plenty of places, um, and nonprofit agencies as well, by the way. So de definitely different types of agencies where one could work and do their practicum for that matter. Thank you. And then um, I think kind of a question both for Tiara and, and Nathan, and actually even Dr. Clark coming in. Tiara, if you could first, um, you know, the person asked, I've, I've heard a ton of great things about the Trojan Network. How has that impacted you personally and, and professionally? Um, definitely, you get a lot of email reminders reminding you that you are a part of the network and that you can reach out to several alumni and faculty. So I love that because sometimes in, when you get into the day-to-day -day grind, you forget how many people are, are in that support system. Personally, like having that constant reminder is like, okay, if I ever have a question, I could put it out to a group of people that have that commitment, right, to serve and, and um, work. So personally, I, having that is reassuring. Professionally, I've actually um, attended a presentation in August it's called the Community Scholars Collaborative on Health Equity Solution, and it's a collaborative that, that several of the faculty at USC um, are a part of and different other departments like cin cinematography and things like that. And um, at that, we were presenting the research project with the PIs, and there was a lot of the professors that I recognized from the video conferencing that I was able to reconnect with and um, again get that encouragement and that you're not alone that they're always just even before this Dr. Kumar I was talking to her about possibly going to get my uh, PhD and she offered to have a conversation and talk um, via email and, and just that willingness to help to help you get to where you need to go is greatly appreciated. So for me, uh, the alumni network was very real. I made a ton of friends, even on the online program. Uh, you have 
you know, you have study get togethers, you have tutoring, you have mentorship, you have, you know, people doing the same struggling as you do. All you do is sync phone numbers and you can do everything you do online. And most of the people were in the same area. So uh, I even graduated on stage with a few of my friends. So that was nice. And then as for the alumni network itself, I am an alumni. I've got the alumni card. I get all the notices. And uh, my LinkedIn is just full of other USC alumni. So there's definitely a lot of networking going on and opportunities uh, everywhere. Thank you both. Um, Dr. Kumar, anything to add from your perspective of, of you know, the kind of Trojan network? Yeah, just that, um, you know, we have uh, Trojans all over the world. So the network is, is very large. It's a global network. Um, and, you know, with the online MPH program specifically, um, we've got plenty of students who reside in L.A. County and throughout California, but as well throughout the United States and some who are international. So there's a lot of networking opportunities, which, you know, you will end up doing just in your classes through group projects and live sessions, et cetera, and then, you know, have access to um, group chats and, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook and all that good stuff to be able to continue to stay in touch uh, with you know, the MPH students uh, from both online and on-campus programs and the larger Trojan community. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, I think as we're kind of coming towards the end of our time here and the, the last questions I do see, um, I really just want to thank you, Dr. Kumar and, and uh, Tira and, and Nathan as well. Um, you know, thank you for your time here and your presentation, your, your um, words, your knowledge, your experience, uh, as well as the attendees here for joining us today. And everyone, have a great night.